if you're a lender, there's a, an easy recipe for maximizing uh, your accounting, fake accounting income, if you're a lender. And it goes like this. Four ingredients. One, grow like crazy. Two, by making really, really crappy loans, but at a premium yield. Yield just means interest rate. Three, while employing extreme leverage. And four, while setting aside only the most trivial reserves, allowances for the uh, inevitable losses that this kind of behavior produces. Because I'll base my compensation as CEO, and, I, and that's the nice thing about being CEO, you get to make the rules for yourself. You'll base it on short-term reported income, and you'll make that compensation extremely large for supposed um, superlative results. In jargon in the industry, stretch goals. Yes. So you're going to say, hey, if I double my income in just a few years, then I get an off-the-charts bonus. Huge compensation. Except that, of course, that goal is easy to meet. You just have to cheat. It well, is a sure thing. Because under international accounting rules, they're being interpreted by many folks as saying, you are not permitted as a lending institution to establish any meaningful allowances for losses, loan losses now, even though it is absolutely certain that making, you know, remember the ingredient is the first two, grow extremely rapidly by making really, really awful loans at a premium yield. Well, that's guaranteed to produce massive losses down the road. The international accounting rules, some people are, actually many people are interpreting as you are not permitted to establish in reserves. So that could create the perfect crime. Uh, George Akerlof and Paul Romer uh, wrote the classic article in economics about this in 1993. I mean, they said these four steps, this, these four ingredients, it's just math. It is, and I'm quoting them now, a sure thing. So you're mathematically guaranteed, if you do these four things, to report not just substantial income, but record levels of income. With modern compensation, first at the executive level, the CEO level, I can guarantee with modern executive compensation that if I follow this recipe, I will personally be wealthy almost immediately as the CEO. But what makes something a liar's loan is that you don't do uh, adequate underwriting. Underwriting is a process of evaluating whether you're going to get repaid when you make a loan and what are the risks of it so that you can price, you know, decide whether you should make the loan on what conditions and at what price you, you should do that. And because when you don't do underwriting um, on this kind of loan, a mortgage loan, you inherently create something that we call adverse selection. So if you thought of running a health uh, insurance company or life insurance company, and you weren't going to do any evaluation of your customer's health or their parents, you know, their uh, genetic relative's health, you were just going to charge a high price for your insurance to co compensate for the risk. Which customers would come to you? Hmm. Well, obviously only the sickest. Uh, same thing if you couldn't determine loan quality and you just charged everybody a high rate of interest as a result. Which customers would come to you? Only the worst. And so in this kind of loans, if you create adverse selection, you create from the lender's perspective a negative expected value of making a loan. In plain English, that means you will lose money. It's equivalent of betting against the house. And therefore, honest lenders don't engage in adverse selection. So it's a wonderful natural experiment as to which entities were clearly engaged in fraud. Entities making liars' loans were clearly engaged in fraud, mortgage lenders uh, doing that. By 2000, 
2004, the FBI warns two things. One, that there is an epidemic of mortgage fraud. Epidemic was their word. And two, warns that it will produce a financial crisis, crisis being their word, if it is not checked. 2004. In early 2006, the industry, the lending industries, own anti-fraud experts, a group called BARI, an acronym, M-A-R-I, issue a report that goes in writing to every member of the Mortgage Bankers Association, so thousands of entities, everybody involved. And it says, first, loans where you don't underwrite are, quote, an open invitation to fraudsters, unquote. Second, when we've studied them, the incidence of fraud is 90 percent, hmm. nine zero. Yep. So they're virtually all frauds. Third, these loans deserve the phrase that the industry itself uses to describe them. They are liar's loans. Fourth, you apparently have forgotten the experience of the early 90s. Remember when I was telling you about 1990, 1991? Yep when these loans caused hundreds of millions of dollars of losses. Hundreds is even more quaint, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and fifth, the federal banking regulatory agencies. Remember, this is the Bush era. Banking regulatory agencies are warning against making these kinds of loans. Hmm. Okay, so you have all those warnings from the FBI, you have them from the industry's own experts. You have the fact that inherently in economics, you will lose money, that this creates adverse selection and that no honest lender would do this. What happens? What's the industry reaction to hearing all this? Between 2003 and 2006, liars' loans expand over 500%. And this is the perfect natural experiment. You know, you may have heard the stuff, the claims that this Community Reinvestment Act or that was Fannie and Freddie, the affordable housing requirements that drove the crisis. This is a favorite mem. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody ever required any lender to make or any entity to purchase a liar's loan. In fact, Fannie and Freddie were not permitted to count liars' loans towards their affordable housing goal. So the reason they did massive amounts of these loans was because of the fraud recipe. Remember, grow really rapidly by making really crappy loans, but at a premium yield. And liars' loans are perfect for that. In the old days, the things we used to prosecute people, we had actual rules, and they were really simple rules on underwriting. In essence, you can summarize it in this brief statement. One, before you make the loan, you have to underwrite. Two, you have to document that the borrower has the, re the ability to repay the loan. And three, you have to keep a written record of this underwriting. Now, if you have those three simple rules, which any honest lender would do if regulators never existed, right? They do all three of those things. So it imposes no cost on the honest portion of the industry. You can see there's a bind if you want to lie, mm -hmm. if you want to do liar's loans, right? Because if you're going to loan to people who are make really crappy loans, you're going to put in your files documentation that you knew you were making bad loans that people couldn't repay. And if you document that you knew that, your regulator is likely to say, even under the Bush administration, uh, well then, uh, uh, maybe you shouldn't make those loans, and maybe it's my job as a regulator to order you to stop them. 
Mm-hmm. Also, if you put the, if you try to change the paper trail so that the regulators don't see that, if you either forge documents or destroy documents, well, that is an, an additional level of fraud that we can prosecute. And we can introduce it to show what your underlying intent was in making these kinds of loans. So that's really good for establishing a fraud case. But with a liar's loan, you don't have to, as the lender, document any lies on your part, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't do any underwriting, so you don't create a paper trail that shows you knew it was a bad loan, because the definition of liar's loan is you don't verify. And so it's a perfect device for doing a fraud, right? So that's one thing that we had done. And by the way, that rule change occurred in the savings and loan industry in 1993 under the Clinton administration. Um, and that was part of reinventing government. And I was personally there to witness this. The regulatory regulators were instructed that we were to refer to the industry and to think of the industry as our, and I'm quoting, client. Mm -hmm. There's no more devastating mindset for ruining regulation than to define the industry you're supposed to regulate as we're supposed to serve that industry instead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in response to these warnings, the industry massively increases liar's loans with nobody requiring it and, indeed, the federal government warning against it, even under the Bush administration, such that by 2006, one out of every three new home loans was a liar's loan. And remember, they're 90% fraudulent. And we also know that it was overwhelmingly lenders who put the lies in the liar's loans and did so by creating those incentive structures to make sure the mortgage bankers and the mortgage brokers would bring them loans consistent with a recipe. Incredible numbers, really crappy, and a premium yield. Okay, so back in the day, in the savings and loan crisis, as Akerlof and Romer said, the examiners in the field recognized that this was looting and fraud from the beginning. And so the re-regulation of the savings and loan industry begins in 1983. Now that's really important because the deregulation of the industry, the big acts, are 1982 and 1983. 1982 by the federal government, the Garn St. Germain Act, and then 1983 by California, and then followed by uh, Texas. And so this, what this created is what we call a regulatory race to the bottom, or economists call sometimes a competition in laxity. Who can have the weakest rules to attract the industry to come because the industry that's committing fraud really what loves weak rules hmm. and California and Texas won where obviously one should be in quotation marks this race to the bottom in the savings and loan crisis hmm. and between just those two states their savings and loans produced two-thirds of total losses for the entire savings and loan debacle think of that two states that deregulated the most, produce two-thirds of the total losses. So fraud is both a civil wrong and a crime. And what it is is when I get you to trust me and then I betray your trust in order to steal from you. And as a result, there's no more effective acid against trust than fraud and in particular, uh, elite fraud, um, which causes people to no longer trust folks, economies break down, families break down, political systems break down, and such. 
if you don't have that kind of trust. And control fraud simply means when you have a seemingly legitimate entity and the person who controls it uses it as a weapon to defraud others. And so in the financial sphere, the weapon of choice is accounting, and these losses from these kinds of control frauds exceed the uh, financial losses from all other forms of property crime combined. Everybody reports to the CEO, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Right? So the CEO is the point failure mechanism where if he or she goes bad, almost everything may go bad as well. So all those things that we call in controls, internal and external controls, all report to the CEO, and the CEO therefore can, as I'll describe, use compensation, hiring, firing, praise, and such, uh, to produce the environment that will commit, uh, allow, create allies for his fraud. Now, note that what I'm saying, the CEO, the art of this is not to defeat your controls. The art, the elegant solution, as in mathematics, is to suborn the controls and turn them into your most valuable allies. And therefore, for example, when you are running an accounting control fraud where your weapon of fraud is accounting and that weapon of choice in finance is accounting, you're going to want to hire the most prestigious accountants as your outside auditors because it is precisely their reputation that is most valuable when they're, you can suborn them and they give you that clean opinion that you just described that will help you deceive other shareholders. So one enormous advantage is internal and external controls come to the CEO level. A second in incredible advantage is the CEO can optimize the firm as a weapon of fraud. And the CEO can do that Basically, this falls into two big categories. One, you can put it in assets that have no readily verifiable market value. Because mm -hmm. then it's a lot easier to inflate asset valuations and to hide real losses. Yeah. And the second thing you do is grow like crazy. And, of course, that is the essence of something you, uh, your listeners have all heard about, and that is a Ponzi scheme. And so these accounting control frauds have strong Ponzi scheme-like elements, which is why they tend to cause such catastrophic losses.